this module we will introduce a new type of analysis called frequency response analysis. So far in this course the type of analysis that we've been doing is what is termed as time response analysis. We've been finding the output of a system as a function of time. There's another type of analysis called frequency response analysis that we'll introduce in this module which is very useful for designing systems in general and control systems in particular. Okay. So just to review, um, we've learned how to determine the time response of a linear system or the output of a system as a function of time in response to arbitrary inputs and arbitrary initial conditions. In other words, we can solve differential equations or given a transfer function and an input, you can find the output. We've also studied the character of certain standard systems to certain standard inputs. In particular, we've memorized the step response of a canonical first order system and the step response of a canonical second order system. We've then used algebra and root locus approaches to place the dominant closed loop poles to give us the desired time response. And by that I mean a time response or a step response that has a certain time constant or overshoot or peak time or whatever. The advantage of a pole placement approach is that we can affect the time response or the output of the system as a function of time directly and this is ultimately what we're trying to achieve. And when we have canonical systems this process is fairly easy. You know, For a first order system or a canonical second order system we have precise algebraic relationships that match the form of the system to the character of its step response. The challenge, however, is when we have non-canonical systems, when we have a higher order system where we don't have one or two poles that dominate, where we have three or four poles that, that contribute to the response, or if we have zeros, um, then these these relationships, these canonical relationships don't hold and it's difficult to determine the exact effect of the higher order poles, the exact effect of the zeros. Furthermore, we've sort of been designing our system to achieve a certain sort of character of step response, but if we want to understand how the system responds to different types of inputs, sometimes uh, the step response can, can be limited in what it tells us. And so it turns out that a frequency response approach to analysis and design can help to overcome some of these limitations of a, of a pole placement approach. So the idea of frequency response is that we input sine waves of different frequencies into a system and look at the system's output in steady state. So instead of looking at how the response of the system changes as a function of time, we will look at how the response of the system changes for inputs of different frequencies. So how does the behavior change as a function of frequency? So it turns out if our system is linear and stable, a sinusoidal input will generate an output that is also sinusoidal and of the same frequency and steady state. And this should make sense if we can think back to, to what we learned at the beginning of the class. In general, a system's response has sort of a homogeneous part and a particular part. Or you can think of it as a system has sort of a part due to the forcing input, and then it has a part due to the sort of the natural response of the system. And in general, the particular solution will have the same form as the forcing input. So since we're forcing the system with a sinusoidal input of a particular frequency, we would expect the particular solution to also be a sinusoid of the same frequency. So for example, if this is our system G of S and we feed it some sinusoidal input with frequency omega and amplitude r, then the output may look something like this. And so in general what we have is we have some transient portion that's due to the natural response of the system, which it is typically a decaying exponential or a decaying sinusoid. So you can imagine, you know, something like this. The exponential determined by the poles of the of the transfer function of the system. And then some 
sinusoidal part that's due to the imaginary part of the pole and conceivably some phase shift. So this transient part, the natural part of the system, will die out as time goes to infinity. So this decaying sinusoid will approach zero because because it's stable or as long as it's stable and that leaves this part which is the particular solution in steady state and it has the same form as the forcing input so here we had a sinusoid of frequency omega so here we also have a sinusoid of frequency omega the only difference is that the output may be scaled so it may have a different amplitude and it may be shifted in time. So for example, if at some instant of time the input is at zero, at that same instant of time the output might be at the peak of the oscillation. And so based on looking at the frequency response of a system, there are two primary quantities of interest. So, you know, in general what we're doing is we have our system, we're feeding sinusoidal inputs of some frequency, and we're looking at what the system behavior is like in steady state. So it's also a sinusoid of the same frequency, but it could be scaled and it could be shifted. And so the two quantities we're interested in are the scaling and the phase shift. These two quantities have implications in, in lots of different applications. So one way that we can arrive at these quantities is, is just by brute force. Um, we can solve the, the system's equations for different sinusoidal inputs, or we could do an experiment on a physical system where we feed it different sinusoidal inputs and observe the output. It turns out we can also calculate this scaling and this phase shift from, from the transfer function. In particular, if our transfer function is g of s, we can calculate the scaling by calculating the magnitude of our transfer function at s equals j omega. So for example, this is our transfer function. If we substitute for s this quantity s equals j omega, then our transfer function is in essence a complex number. And we can find the magnitude of that complex number, and that will tell us the scaling. So you can sort of imagine, you know, we have some complex number with some real part and some imaginary part, then the magnitude is simply the Pythagorean theorem. You can simply uh, take the square of the real part and add it to the square of the imaginary part and take the square root to get the magnitude, to get the hypotenuse. And this fact isn't maybe obvious, um, but they, they go through sort of an explanation in the book. Um, at this point, you can just sort of take it as face value. But this gets back to sort of what we've said it a couple times in the course, how we can interpret S as a, as a frequency. The Laplace variable S can be interpreted as a frequency. We can also calculate the phase shift from the transfer function, where we calculate it as the angle of that complex number when s is equal to j omega. And so in this case, you know, that's the angle. Um, so the, the angle from the positive real axis to the radius uh, from the origin to the particular complex number. And you could calculate that using um, inverse tangent, uh, opposite over adjacent, the imaginary part over the real part and having an understanding of these two quantities, scaling and phase shift, has a lot of implications for designing controllers and designing other things, filters, amplifiers, um, choosing sensors, designing you know, car suspensions and, and drive lines and things like that. And on the next slide, I'll try and give a little bit of intuition. So for a particular type of system, and a particular frequency of input, we can get different scalings in the output. The output could be 
attenuated, it could have a smaller amplitude, or the output could have a larger amplitude. And this attenuation and amplification can both be good and bad depending on the particular situation. So attenuation may be desired if we're trying to decrease the effect of undesirable inputs like noise, like disturbances. So if we're trying to design a filter, we may want our filter to attenuate some frequency, some, you know, the frequency of the noise. We want the noise to come in and to be decreased on the output. Or if we're designing a control system, we may want our system to not react to certain disturbances. So if we have some disturbance coming into our control system, we don't want the output of the system to react to that disturbance. On the other hand, attenuation may be undesired. For example, let's say that you know, we're commanding an input. So we have a cruise control, or we have a, a, a steer-by-wire system where the driver is turning the steering wheel in sort of a, an oscillatory fashion. He's turning the steering wheel quickly. Well, he wants the car to actually react to that input. He doesn't want the, the steering of the car to attenuate his steering command. Looking at attenuation can also be helpful for designing mechanical systems, for example, a car suspension. So with a car suspension, if the input is the motion of the road and the output is the motion of the car body, we want to attenuate bumps in the road. Similarly, amplification can be desirable or undesirable. And something that we'll see later on is that amplification can actually destabilize a system. And some intuition for that could be, um, in essence, you've excited a resonance of the system. Uh, so the output grows unbounded. And that's obviously uh, undesirable. Information about phase lag is also important because in essence a large amount of phase lag means that that information into the system is being delayed uh, so you're trying to sort of perform your control uh, on the basis of old information and it turns out that that this can hurt performance and can also cause the system to go unstable these ideas may may have a little bit of intuition but we'll try and show it sort of more rigorously why why this is true later on So these two important concepts that we're interested in from a system's frequency response, the scaling and the phase shift, can be represented in different ways. So one way is called the Bode diagram, and it represents these two quantities in different graphs, in their own graphs. So one graph represents the magnitude or the scaling, the ratio of the amplitude of the output as compared to the amplitude of the input versus frequency. So how does that scaling change as the as the frequency of the input changes? And then it and then it represents phase in a second plot where phase is also plotted versus frequency of the input. An alternative way to represent this information is with the Nyquist plot, where magnitude is plotted versus phase, so in a single plot. Um, and the Nyquist plot does this using a polar plot form. Whereas uh, an, a Nichols chart also plots magnitude versus phase, but it does it as a rectangular plot. So phase is the horizontal axis, and magnitude or scaling is the vertical axis. In this class, we will focus on the Bode diagram. Okay. So here is an example of a Bode diagram. It consists of two graphs, one of magnitude or scaling, and one for phase and their graft versus frequency. And so you can sort of imagine, you know, we have our system. We put in some sort of sinusoidal input and we look at the, what the behavior is in steady state. So for this frequency, for the omega of this input, how much is the output scaled and how much is it shifted in time? And so at a particular frequency, so let's say 10 radians per second, we would get one sort of data point. That's the scaling, and that's the phase shift. Okay. 
you know, and then we would try a different frequency input. And so this frequency is much slower, a much smaller frequency, and we'll get a different sort of behavior on the output. You know, a different amount of scaling, a different amount of phase shift. So maybe at one radian per second we get a different phase shift, we get a different scaling. And you do that sort of point by point and you can fill out this plot. When we do this, the magnitude plot is plotted in decibels. So the magnitude is this scaling y over r and to put it in the form of a decibel it's 20 times the log of the scaling and the frequency is in radians per second and it's also plotted on a log scale so you can see here um, equal distances on the graph mark factors of 10 so the distance between point 1 and 1 is the same as the distance between 1 and 10. So it's a log base 10 scale on the frequency axis. For the phase plot, phase is plotted in degrees and frequency is again in radians per second. So while we have this Bode diagram up, let's try and take a look at it and try and understand what's happening. So what do you think is happening here? So take a look at that and see if you can think about that. Okay. So in this part of the frequency response plot, in this, in this region of the Bode diagram, you can see that the magnitude is positive decibels. And so a logarithm is greater than zero is positive when y over r is greater than one. So. so that means that in essence here the output is amplifying the input. The amplitude of the output is larger than the amplitude of the input. And you can imagine that this is maybe near sort of a natural frequency of the system or sort of a resonance of the system. Let's take a look at what's happening at low frequencies. So what do you think is happening at low frequencies? So at low frequencies the magnitude is zero. So zero means that y over r is equal to 1. So the amplitude of the output is exactly equal to the amplitude of the, of the input. And the phase is very close to 0. So they're basically almost in sync. And so this makes a lot of sense. You know, if we have our system and we give it a slowly changing input, the system can sort of keep up with that it can sort of track that. Uh, so the output will be have a similar amplitude and a similar phase. What about when we do high frequencies? What do we think this represents? What do we think this means? So here the decibels are negative. So a logarithm is negative when its argument is less than 1. So that means out here we're getting a lot of attenuation. So the, the output amplitude is much smaller than the input amplitude. So we put in this very fast changing input. And the output has a very small amplitude. And if we look at the phase, the phase is minus 180 degrees. So that means they're basically out of sync. So you know, one cycle is 360 degrees. So when the input is at its peak, the output is at its valley, and vice versa. Okay. 
So just very simply, you know, looking at the Bode diagram can tell us a lot. If this were uh, a filter, then you know this tells us sort of the frequency of inputs that we that we attenuate. You know, it sort of it tells us what the pass band of the filter is and what the blocking band of the filter is, and it helps us design a filter. If this is a car suspension, then it tells us sort of what kind of roads we can drive on, and and attenuate or get a smooth ride, and where we'll sort of get a, a bump or a resonance in our in our car suspension. So this frequency response information is very helpful in the design of lots of different types of systems. On the next slide, we'll show two alternative means for displaying frequency response information graphically, namely the Nichols plot and the Nyquist plot. So with a Bode plot at a given frequency, so let's say at this frequency, so this is 10, so this is 9, 8, 7, so at 7 radians per second, we have a phase of minus 90 degrees and a magnitude that's, uh, you know, 2 decibels or something. And so the phase information is plotted versus frequency on one plot, and the magnitude is plotted versus frequency on a different plot. With a Nichols chart, the phase and magnitude are plotted on the same plot. So at a given frequency, you know, so this point corresponds to omega equals 7 radians per second, we have a phase of minus 90 degrees and a magnitude of 2 decibels or whatever. It's where phase is the horizontal axis and magnitude is the vertical axis. And each point is a different frequency. So down here is, is small frequencies. We increase omega. And this is as omega goes to infinity. Another plot, the Nyquist plot, also plots magnitude and phase on the same set of axes. But instead of being a Cartesian plot or a rectangular plot like the Nichols chart is, the Nyquist plot is a polar plot. So again, each point on this graph represents a particular frequency. Um, this is the same omega, where we're 90 degrees away from the positive real axis, and the distance from the origin is the magnitude. So in this case, uh, the distance, we're not in decibels. Um, but it's uh, you know it's something under two, but it's greater than one, so we're amplifying. And this plot over here, this point over here, you know the phase is maybe negative 45 degrees, and the and the magnitude is is something a little bit greater than one, and so on. And so we plot from something where omega is very small, increase omega, and this is omega approaching infinity. With the Nyquist plot, it also plots the reflection of the frequency response from zero, from omega equals zero to omega equals infinity, um, but we won't get into that in this class. In this class, we will basically stick with the Bode plot, uh, and the reason that we do that is because the Bode plot is, is useful for analysis, especially for simpler systems. Um, but it's really useful for controller design. Nyquist plots and Nichols charts, by putting the phase and magnitude information on the same plot, it allows you to do some things with analysis that's, that's quite nice, um, but it's much more challenging to design controllers using Nichols charts and Nyquist plots. Um, so in this class, we will focus on, on, the, Bode, on the Bode diagram. So this brings us to the conclusion of module 19. In this module, we introduce the notion of frequency response as an alternative to time response analysis. And so the idea is that we put in sinusoidal inputs of different frequencies, and we look at the steady state behavior of our system, where the steady state output will, be, will also be a sinusoid of the same frequency, but it may be scaled and shifted. And the amount of scaling and shift in our output 
is important for the design of many different types of systems, filters, uh, car suspensions, control systems. And there are different ways to display this information. We primarily in this class will use a Bode diagram representation where we plot uh, phase versus frequency and magnitude versus frequency on two different plots. Other alternatives are the Nyquist plot and the Nichols chart which plot magnitude and phase on the same plot.